Welcome to this lesson from Transparent Physics where we'll be talking about the biological effects of ionizing radiation. And we should probably start with a little bit of a disclaimer here. Uh, remember I'm a physics teacher, I'm not a medical professional. So if it's like a nuclear event and you're searching YouTube for a video about the biological effects of radiation and your cell phone only has like 20 minutes left and you need to find the exact video to save lives. Um, keep scrolling past this one. This is not going to be the video for you. This is an overview video. Um, just covering the main ideas, the main points. But I'm happy to share what I know with the rest of you right now. So, let's begin. First of all, in talking about radiation, let's, let's review uh, the topic of ionizing radiation. Ionizing radiation, if we remember... Uh, is radiation that has enough energy to detach electrons from atoms or molecules. And if we are to compare the two flavors of radiation, electromagnetic radiation and nuclear radiation, all nuclear radiation is ionizing. Alpha, beta, and gamma are all ionizing, period. End. Uh, some electromagnetic radiation is ionizing. Specifically, uh, it starts in the ultraviolet. Not all ultraviolet light is ionizing but some ultraviolet light is ionizing and then upward from there so that includes x-rays and gamma rays those are ionizing so well, that's the ones we'll be worrying about uh, remember not all radiation is ionizing uh, for example a radio wave is technically electromagnetic radiation but it's not ionizing radiation nor is a microwave for that matter now ionizing radiation specifically impacts atoms they remove electrons from atoms, although an ionized atom can affect a molecule. Molecules can be affected to affect cells, which can be affected to tissues, etc. So, so this effect can cascade up through biological systems, but ultimately ionizing radiation targets atoms. <laughs> All right, now <laughs> the units. Oh my goodness, this is... This is probably one of the places where it gets kind of confusing when we start talking about this because there are so many different types of units when we are dealing with radiation. Part of that is because there's lots of nuances when we are talking about the impact of radiation on tissues. So what we'll do is we'll run through them. Uh, we'll try to get a sense. You may see some familiar units. Some of these units have made their way into sort of pop culture and let's see what you recognize as we go down through and i'm gonna maybe snag a second sheet here just so we aren't looking at too much at once here all right so in any case we're going to be looking at um, the the term itself we're going to go over the meaning of it and then not only are there multiple terms but those terms also have uh, the conventional unit, sometimes known as the British unit, uh, and the SI unit, the metric unit, effectively. So let's take a look. All right, so the first one is one that we really will not talk about from this point onward, but I'll just introduce it because it comes into play sometimes, is the idea of radioactivity itself. This is the original sample. Like if we had a radioactive isotope, we could talk about its radioactivity and it's the amount of radioactivity in the source material. For us, if we're interested in the biological effects of radiation, I don't really care how much radiation a, a particular you know, rock has in it. Uh, I'm more interested in the effect that has on the biological tissues. So there are units, uh, Curie's and Becquerel's. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, these people shared a Nobel Prize for the basically discovery of uh, radiation back in early 1900s. I don't remember exactly what year it was, but it was one of the first Nobel Prizes in physics given out. And of course, Marie Curie went on to win two Nobel Prizes, and I believe she's one of the only people uh, in the world who has ever won Nobel Prizes for two different fields. She won one for chemistry and one for physics. Okay, but that's really all we'll say about radioactivity itself here. Uh, all the other units are more biologically focused. Well, at least getting to the point where they're biologically focused. All right. Next up is the idea of exposure. So radioactivity is how much is actually in the material itself. Uh, but exposure is how much that you know, how much of that actually could interact with whatever target tissue we're interested in. Uh, 
So it's, it's a percentage of the radioactivity emitted from the object. Um, your exposure depends on uh, you know, probably your cross-sectional area and your, your distance from the source and all kinds of things. But uh, effectively, uh, we don't really use a, I don't really see this come up necessarily a lot too in, in medical applications. Um, there's more important considerations as you go. Uh, Rentgens uh, or Coulombs per kilogram. Rentgen uh, is another uh, individual involved in the history of radioactive materials. Now from here on out, we begin to get a little bit more focused on biological stuff. Specifically here, we're going to start seeing um, this unit, or these units particularly. Uh, next is the absorbed dose. Now exposure is how much actually interacts with your body in a way that you could absorb the radiation. Uh, but not all of the stuff that you're exposed to is actually going to deposit energy into your cells. The absorbed dose tells us of the exposure, basically how much is taken in by the tissue. So it really doesn't really matter what our overall exposure is. What is more important is how much is absorbed by our tissues. And here uh, we have, uh, if, you've, if you play video games, uh, you've probably seen RADs before. Uh, rad is a is a measure of how much radiation you're absorbing. That's the conventional sort of British unit. Grays are the SI unit. They measure the same thing. They're just different scales for the different unit systems. So, RADs. Uh, rad is actually a, an abbreviation for radiation absorbed dose, which is cool because that's literally what it is. It's it's the, it's the absorbed dose. So, Rad is literally uh, what it stands for. So that's pretty. Uh, Pretty rad. Uh, I can't imagine that. It's been the first time that joke's been made in the history of radiation, but let's take a look here. And more units. More units. Send more units. Next up. Uh, in fact, I'll show these guys at the same time because they're close enough to each other that I can get away with it. All right. And the next two ones are, are very similar to each other, and I had to do a little extra research to try to parse them from each other. If you notice, their units are the same. There is the equivalent dose and there's the effective dose. Now the equivalent dose is a, a factor of, we, we had our absorbed dose up here. The absorbed dose tells us the amount of energy taken in. Now the amount of energy taken in is important, but it is scaled according to the type of radiation that you're getting hit with. And I mentioned this in an early video. For example, um, alpha particles are super damaging to biological tissue. There's a lot of energy that gets deposited in a very small area. So the equivalent dose for, for a given absorbed dose, if you absorbed equal amounts of say, beta minus radiation and alpha radiation, if you absorbed equal amounts, the equivalent dose is not going to be the same because alpha particles basically hit biological tissues a lot heavier. We're not going to worry about the exact numbers, but the idea is that the equivalent dose scales for the type of radiation. We mentioned the idea that, that, that gamma really, even though it's very high energy, you could have a very high absorbed dose of gamma. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be suffering as much damage as you would from technically a lower absorbed dose of alpha radiation, because alpha radiation is going to give you a higher equivalent dose. Um, the, the units for that are REMS which is another abbreviation for Rentgen Equivalent Man. Uh, I'm sure there's a, a story behind that. I don't know it though. Uh, but this one we've seen a little bit before Sieverts uh, in the previous video. Um, I believe Sieverts came up when we were talking about uh, background radiation and exposures. And now a sievert is a pretty big unit of radiation. So often we'll see it as like millisieverts with a little M in front of it. Now, effective dose, I, I really did some extra research between equivalent dose and effective dose. I, I wasn't even really certain that they were all that different from each other. I was able to parse out, uh, based on my research, that the um, absorbed dose scales based on the radiosensitivity of the targeted tissue. So we, we have to factor in the idea that different types of radiation hit heavier than other types of radiation. We also need to factor in for the fact that different tissues are more or less sensitive to radiation. Uh, 
So while the equivalent dose scales for the type of radiation that is impacting us, the effective dose scales for what it's actually hitting. How effective is it in ionizing the tissue of that particular part of the body? Now, I, I couldn't find a lot of information as, to me, it would seem logical that the effective dose, in order to really say what the effective dose is about, it, it would have to take into account the equivalent dose. Um, but I, I really can't find confirmation of that specifically in the sites that I look for. A lot of sites sort of even basically uh, make these two equal to each other. They do share units, but I, I don't believe that they're actually the same thing. So I'm going to leave this with a little bit of a question mark here. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, if you, if you find out anything about it, go ahead and leave a comment in the video and uh, let me know what you've discovered. That's our, our unit zoo. In terms of really what we're going to be seeing overall, if I pull back a little bit, wrong way. Uh, I would say most common, uh, rats, obviously pop culture, we see that a lot. Uh, grays, the metric version is pretty significant. And a lot of, we'll see a lot of sieverts and rems. Really, these are the ones that are more significant for biological applications because these are the ones that talk about, okay, we really it starts to get to the nitty gritty about what, what's the amount that we really need to worry about as far as the exposure goes. Okay. Switching over. Take a quick break here. Uh, take a quick uh, sip of tea. A little halftime show there. All right. Ready for round two. Now let's talk. When the ionizing radiation hits your DNA, there's actually... Uh, two different routes that it can take uh, to get towards damaging your cells. And that is the idea of direct versus indirect damage. Now direct damage is, is pretty much exactly what it sounds. Uh, the radiation comes in and directly hits the DNA. And we tend to focus on the DNA because that's really the, the blueprint of the cell. If you damage the DNA, that has uh, implications um, on, on many sort of levels of how about how that well that cell is going to function. So direct damage is, is literally the radiation comes in and damages the DNA. Okay, but that is not the only way to do it. Um, there is what's called indirect damage. And uh, indirect damage basically is the idea of the radiation comes in, doesn't necessarily hit the DNA, but affects atoms or molecules near biome uh, and, and ionizes those. Uh, this process is called creating free radicals. And the, the free radicals can then damage the DNA. I, I sort of consider the metaphor like the idea of, uh, it's kind of like zombies. And uh, you know maybe you don't get bit by the zombie, but the zombie bites the person next to you. And then that person could bite you. So you're not directly affected by the first zombie, but you could be damaged by the side effects of that first zombie's actions. So if we have ionized particles adjacent to DNA, uh, they can damage that DNA. Uh, and again, the goal of ionized atoms or molecules is to try to fill their outer electron shell. That's one of the goals in chemistry. You, you, you learn the idea that Nobody likes having a, a, a barely empty, you know, like, a, like like seven out of eight electrons. They, they'd want to make sure they fill that last electron in there, and they'll sometimes be very aggressive in doing that. An example of how that happens in the body uh, actually involves water. So if there's water in the cell uh, near DNA, and the DNA uh, gets uh, avoids a direct shot, but the water next to it takes a shot, um, the HDO could split into uh, H and OH, and there probably should be, oh, I don't want to guess, there should be ion notations on these guys. Um, uh, I don't want to take a guess. One of these should be plus, one of these should be minus. They're each going to be their own sort of ions. And uh, what it basically it's called is a hydroxyl radical. And then this guy could end up rearranging uh, with another one and end up creating H2O2, for example. And H2O2, uh, popularly known as hydrogen peroxide, and this hydrogen peroxide in close proximity to the DNA could end up damaging the DNA. So you can directly damage the DNA by impacting it, or you can cause damage to adjacent items, which could then damage the DNA. 
This process of indirect damage is very important in treating, say, cancers with radiation because you're not always going to hit the tumor directly uh, where you want to, but the more indirect damage that you can do, uh, any radiation that misses the target directly can still have an impact towards treatment. Okay, now when you are hitting cells with ionizing radiation, there's, there's a couple different things that could happen. It's a, it's a pretty random event. It's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen. But uh, in terms of things that we could see, uh, basically, we, we have a, a range of values here. I mean, in theory, a cell could interact with radiation and not suffer any damage at all. So I guess depending on the circumstances, that could be good or bad. Now, the, uh, the DNA could be hit and it could be damaged, but um, it could be repaired by the cell. And I, and I know only a little bit about this, but I know that your cells and your body have a lot of tools and techniques for actually repairing damaged DNA. It's pretty crazy what a, what a good job your body can do a lot of the time. So, uh, and again, DNA gets screwed up all the time, not just by radiation, just by random transcription errors and things like that. So um, your body has techniques in place just because the DNA has been damaged doesn't mean that's a permanent problem. Your tools from your body can come in and, and, and fix the error. Uh, sometimes perfectly, sometimes imperfectly, uh, but your body has ways to approach that. Um, if you get damage and it's not repaired properly, in theory that could lead to a mutation. If the DNA is altered in a way and that alteration you know, can affect the performance of the cell or it's passed down to other cells as it gets split, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about mutations a little bit later. Um, and in theory the cell could just die. Um, you know, the radiation might just kill the uh, cell off directly. Um, sometimes when a cell realizes that it's been damaged significantly, it can actually destroy itself. This process is called apoptosis. Um, also, your body can recognize when a cell's been damaged critically and uh, execute the cell as well. Um, so there, there are lots of opportunities for if the damage is severe for the cell itself to die. And uh, in some ways that might be a good thing. Uh, if it's long, you know, it's not going to go carrying on a mutation as long as too many cells don't die at the same time. If you have a lot of cells dying at the same time, that's good. It could impede the performance of, of organ systems and, and that's no good. But and a cell here or there, I guess, yeah, in the, in the big scheme of things, probably better for a cell to die off than for it to become cancerous. So, all right. Now, uh, I mentioned this a little bit before with the idea of the equivalent dose versus the effective dose. Uh, but not all tissue is equally vulnerable to radiation. And I don't profess to be anywhere near uh, an expert at this, uh, but generally speaking, if we're looking for cells that could be more sensitive to damage from radiation, um, the cells that reproduce more rapidly are more vulnerable to radiation. Um, this has a lot to do, I think there, there's certain phases in the cell cycle whenever the DNA is sort of exposed, in process of, of being uh, the cell reproducing, it's more easily damaged. So any cell that reproduces more rapidly puts itself in that position more often and makes itself more vulnerable to damage from radiation. I also saw information that refers to the idea that the less mature the cell is, uh, the more vulnerable it is to damage. More mature and specialized cells tend to be a little more resilient towards radiation, generally speaking. If we put this in a, in a spectrum, Here's just a couple examples uh, from one end to the other. Uh, low sensitivity to radiation includes things like uh, muscle tissue, brain tissue, and spinal cord tissue. So uh, you can hit that with more radiation and it will not necessarily be as effective as other tissues. Intermediates might be uh, bone or cartilage that's growing and uh, stomach tissue. And then high sensitivity things would be like uh, blood, uh, reproductive cells, hair cells, um, and intestines. Uh, these objects are much more sensitive to radiation. So if we're talking about the effective dose, uh, if, say, the uh, your brain and uh, your intestines were hit with the same amount of radiation or, or absorbed the same amount of radiation, let's say, the effective dose would be much higher for intestines than it would be for the brain because the brain 
is less sensitive to radiation than the intestines are. And if you're undergoing treatment with radiation, your, your medical professionals are going to be aware of these differences, and they can use that to sort of adjust the amount of radiation in different ways. Um, when we are looking at the amount of radiation, the overall effects of that depend on both the amount of radiation and the time frame of the exposure. Uh, I sometimes use the metaphor where you know, if you get stung by a bee once a day, I mean, that's not a great thing, but for most people, that's not going to be an issue. Uh, on the other hand, if you get stung by 365 bees in one day, um, you know, that is a lot of bees stinging you at one time. So you could take those 365, sting, 365 stings and spread them out one a day over a year, and that's doable get all 365 stings at one time, could be fatal. Radiation is kind of similar. Um, you can get low levels of radiation in your body. As we talked about in the previous video, your body has always been in an environment where there's going to be radiation that could potentially damage it. And that's been long before we had technology. Um, our environment is naturally radioactive, so our body's going to have ways to deal with that. Um, so low levels of radiation, aren't necessarily um, you know, easily identified as being damaging, uh, but if you get a lot of radiation at once, uh, it can be a bigger problem. Um, so, if you get a lot of radiation at once, uh, it's called an acute exposure. Uh, it is sometimes also known as deterministic exposure. The idea is that uh, it, you can tell that there is a direct connection between the amount of uh, radiation that you get and the symptoms that come as a result of it. It's pretty clear to determine the connection between the two of them. Uh, there is a threshold, if you will, where you have to get a certain amount of radiation within that time frame to trigger the effects. If you don't reach that threshold, you're not going to get the effects of the acute exposure, whichever ones you're specifically looking at. Uh, just as a, a sample of some potential uh, acute exposure ranges here and the GY stands for grays which we identified as uh, under absorbed dose for the amount of tissue energy taken in by the tissue so if you were to get two grays of radiation which is which is a, a decent amount uh, it's a lot um, you would be suffering uh, easily a loss of hair damage to your bone marrow uh, Right around five grays is where I identified where it really starts becoming definitely uh, uh, on the order of magnitude where it's where it could be lethal uh, within about two weeks. If you bump that up to ten grays, obviously much uh, much more lethal. Uh, you'll start to experience gastrointestinal failure, and I, I I did notice that again the brain and the spinal cord has lower sensitivity to radiation, but if we're talking 20 grays, I, I, I found out that your nervous system can actually be affected by the radiation such that um, you can actually go unconscious from the radiation hitting your body. So that, I mean, 20 grays is a lot of radiation. Two grays is a lot of radiation. Uh, most people will never be exposed to that amount of radiation um, in, in an acute exposure. You'd have to be dealing with some, some serious stuff in order for that to happen. Now, we live in an environment with lots of background radiation and opportunities for smaller amounts of radiation. These lower exposures um, are, are known as stochastic exposure. And the idea is that a lower exposure is going to influence the odds that you're going to be developing cancer later on. And these don't have a minimum threshold to trigger. The argument here is that uh, just the exposure to them is going to increase the odds that you're going to develop cancer later on. Uh, and there's not like an amount that's too small to potentially increase your risk. Now, again, there's amounts that are small enough that you, you know, shouldn't lie awake worrying about it. But um, there, there's no single number or like, well, you didn't get enough in that exposure. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely no problem later on. I mean, in theory, technically, you could get a, you know, a, you know, an x-ray and you end up with cancer 20 years later from it, uh, even if it wasn't a very large amount of radiation at that time. So uh, we have acute and uh, stochastic exposure. Between the two of those, um, it, it covers kind of the spectrum. 
now where acute exposures are very much, you know, we, we know you got a large amount of radiation in a short period of time, um, a, a stochastic exposure, it, it's hard to necessarily know. I mean, you could suspect it, um, but because you're always exposed to low amounts of radiation all the time, it's, it's, it's hard to say sometimes where, oh, you know, if you got this cancer, definitely we could track it back to this incident eight years ago. Now, that's not always the case, but, but you can't always track it down. So we'll end up with um, a question that sometimes people are interested in. Um, and the, the idea is uh, a lot of superhero stories uh, like using the idea of radiation. And the question is, can you get uh, turned into a superhero by exposure to radiation? Uh, a couple famous instances of that are uh, the original origin story of the Fantastic Four. They, they got exposed to cosmic radiation up in space. Uh, the Incredible Hulk got exposed to gamma radiation at a nuclear testing site. Um, even to a smaller extent, Spider-Man technically was bitten by a radioactive spider. Um, that's maybe a little more complicated because if the radiation like binded with the venom, it's sort of like a like a radiological pharmaceutical at that point. Uh, so it's a little less random than say just general exposure to radiation overall. Um, but uh, long story short, exposing yourself to radiation will not turn you into a superhero. Uh, whether or not we consider the realistic perspectives of radiation granting you superpowers, the argument is that every time you're exposed to radiation, um, you are going to have a random effect cell by cell by cell. So even if you have two identical skin cells sitting next to each other and they get hit by the exact same amount of radiation, they aren't necessarily going to absorb the same amount. Even if they absorb the same amount, it won't necessarily hit the DNA in both cases. If it hits the DNA in both cases, it won't necessarily hit the exact same part of the DNA in both cases. So when cells get hit by radiation, it's a cascade of, of, of random responses. And even if every cell was to be hit and affected the same way, we already talked about the idea that your body can come in and repair it. Now, it doesn't always repair it well. So even if you had multiple cells that were impacted the same way, um, your body might come and repair some of them. So you don't you know, necessarily get the quote unquote benefit of that radiation. So long story short, uh, if you have uh, life goals to expose yourself to a large amount of radiation and hope to get a body wide systemic mutation, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bet the farm on it. Just, uh, it's not going to happen. So, now that said, uh, being good at physics is its own superpower. So, keep studying, kids, and you can be a hero too. All right. Well, thank you for joining us for this lesson on the biological effects of radiation. Um, a lot to think through, and this is really should be just considered as a as an introductory level discussion of a lot of topics that you could really spend your entire career becoming an expert on. But I hope that we've had the opportunity to make this material a little clearer for you with transparent physics.